All right. Hello, everybody. I just clicked record. So if you want to rewatch today's webinar, um, we will have the recording posted on our website um, with a PDF of today's presentation. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Danielle Coco, and I'm the marketing director at SESTA. Um, I've seen a lot of you, or I guess you've seen me. I haven't gotten to see you, unfortunately, um, during our weekly webinars while we have been um, all working from home. So thank you for joining us again today. We are very excited to welcome two um, wonderful featured speakers um, who are going to talk about how to build your brand using social media and in particular in the Canadian market. Um, so we have Matthew Stradioto. He is a co-founder at Matchstick, um, which is a leading agency that specializes in social media marketing and digital engagement. Um, and his company was um, recently acquired or joined the Argyle Group of Companies um, in Canada and Argyle Public Relationships has been Susta's Canadian consultant for about a decade. Um, and we have um, Allison George, who is a senior vice president at Argyle. So welcome to both of you um, and thank you so much for being with us today. Um, a few housekeeping notes. Um, again, we are recording this webinar and it will be posted on our website, you'll just log into your MySesta account and click on past webinars, um, and you'll find the recording as well as a PDF of the presentation. And um, you'll also see all of our other webinars that we've been hosting, um, you know, every week for the last, gosh, month and a half or so, but also throughout the last few months. Um, we've had a lot of uh, webinars covering a variety of topics. So um, you are all muted right now, um, just to cut down on all the background noise. So if you have any questions, type them into the Q&A box and we'll address those at the end of the webinar. Um, okay, why are we not advancing? There we go. All right, for those of you who are new to SESTA, I just wanted to touch quickly on our two programs. Um, global events is where companies can meet foreign buyers, uh, qualified foreign buyers, either during trade missions or at SESTA pavilions um, at international trade shows. Um, of course, we're not traveling right now, so we have a few virtual options that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then we have our 50% cost share program which is where companies can apply to receive 50% reimbursement of certain international marketing expenses. Um, two great programs, and there are definitely ways that you can be using these programs now, even though um, we're all in a some, some sort of a lockdown situation. I know each state is a little bit different. Um, so one way that we are uh, continuing to support our companies is we are offering virtual consultations with our foreign consultants. Um, so with Allison and Heidi at Argyle um, in Canada, but also with our consultants in Europe, Mexico, India, China, and Hong Kong. Um, so these are going to be free consultations um, and they will be tailored to your company and your products. They'll last about 25 minutes um, and so it's a great way to ask questions and get direct feedback from experts in those particular markets. Um, so please uh, take a look at those if any of those markets are um, in your strategy. And then we also recently launched for the first time ever a virtual trade mission. Um, I will tell you up front, it is already full. It filled up today, um, but we do have waitlisting in case somebody backs out. So um, if this is something that's interesting to you, take a look at um, joining the waitlist. And, um, you know, depending on how this first one goes, who knows, we, there might be, you know, more opportunities like this in the future. Um, but while companies are not traveling, this is a way to get in front of foreign buyers. So it will include a consultation with our Canadian consultant. Um, they will do a market assessment for your company and your products. And then you will virtually meet with up to three Canadian buyers. Um, and in advance, you will have shipped your product samples um, to our consultants, um, to Argyle, and they will get your, uh, your samples to those buyers in advance. Um, it's a $25 fee to participate and included in that is reimbursement of up to $200 to get your um, samples shipped to Canada. So 
keep that in mind. Um, again, it's the first time we've ever done this and this one's full, but um, you know, I would imagine assuming it goes well, we might see more of these in the future, um, especially if our, our new normal lasts a bit longer. Um, so wanted to mention those. And then today's webinar, you know, we are gonna be focusing on how to build your brand using social media in the international marketplace um, in this case in Canada. And this is following last week's webinar where we were talking about how to use cost share now. So you're not traveling, which is a cost share expense that you can get reimbursed for. You're not going to trade events, um, but you can meet your customers online. Um, social media ads, um, strategies to target folks on social media, um, digital ads, you know, Google ads, you can really, you can target people by location, by age, um, you know, a lot of different demographics. Um, people are going to groceries and pharmacies. These are essential uh, retail outlets. So you can also use the cost share program for in-store displays. Um, and then also keep in mind traditional advertising. So that was last week's webinar and it really, um, kind of set us up for this week where we're gonna really uh, take a deeper dive into social media. Um, I am not an expert, so we brought in the experts and we are very excited to hear from them. So um, I will go ahead and ask Matthew if he would like to share his screen. Sure. So, let me know if you can see that. Yep. All good. Okay, wonderful. Hello, everybody. Uh, really wonderful to be here and uh, welcome to, uh, to this webinar. As Danielle said, I mean, today we do want to cover uh, some best practices for reaching Canadian, uh, Canadian consumers through social media. But before we dive into that, um, I thought I'd start with a little bit of background that sort of might help explain this uh, trajectory. So. Um, really up until recently, uh, my name is Matthew Stradioto and I was running a boutique digital and social media agency in Canada and that, that agency is called Matchstick. And there we, we were pioneering sort of a Canadian practice of advising, developing, executing and reporting on digital marketing strategies for our clients. And last summer, uh, as Danielle has mentioned, we joined the Argyle Group really with the aim of developing and deepening a, a new suite of digital services and expertise that would cut across Argyle's unique practice groups within Canada. And so today that digital team brings together professionals with expertise in digital strategy, um, analysis, full stack web development, paid digital advertising, which we'll talk a little bit about today, uh, content creation and online community and brand management. And, um, you know, for those of you who don't know, Argyle is an independently owned national agency now with almost 100 staff reaching across seven cities in Canada. And we're certainly proud to be working with and to represent SUSTA and the SUSTA mandate in Canada, and really happy to have this chance to connect with you all today and to share our thoughts. So I wanted to, to maybe start with some examples just to give some context to the type of work that we do in Canada and some of the clients that we work with. Um, so just a couple of examples. We have an established history, um, both with Matchstick actually and now with the wider Argyle agency of working in the food and beverage space. And, and one of our longest standing clients in that space is Beam Suntory, which is some of you may know now the third largest producer of spirits worldwide. And we work with them um, with over a dozen of their spirit brands interacting with their marketing team in Toronto and their global brand team based in Chicago. And one of the brands we're very active with in Canada is Canadian Club Whiskey, which is a dominant uh, Canadian whiskey brand that's really sought in Canada at least to gain traction with a younger section of millennial males and Matchstick is the agency that produces, in this case, social media ad content. We do their photography, videography, uh, ad placement, uh, and ad planning. Uh, and one of the things we're, we're really proud of is how, with Beam, we've sort of brought a best practice to their marketing in terms of how to approach um, success in what we call the social mobile news feed. And that's by creating content 
and ad campaigns that really work within that environment. And I'll get, I'll get into these nuances today, um, how we approach thinking about you know, advertising on social, how we plan for a new type of content uh, that, that is, is still relatively a new animal in the marketing game. You know, we also bring to Beam a good understanding of how to use the tools and the ad products that exist across social media platforms. This is an example, for instance, of what some of you may know as a Facebook Canvas ad. Uh, and here we're leveraging this opportunity to take over a full screen mobile environment to turn a newsfeed ad, for instance, here into something that's more engaging, more intriguing for this uh, target of a millennial male. This is, in this case, it's a whiskey quiz about uh, how much you might, might know about your, your whiskeys, Canadian, Irish, et cetera. One more example here, our, our deep specialty in food and beverage, you know, extends also into the packaged meat category through our work with Johnsonville uh, in Canada. Uh, Matchstick has been working with Johnsonville since a, about 2015 and we're their digital creative and social media marketing partner in Canada. And many of you may know that Johnsonville has the very unique notoriety of being the largest producer of sausages in the world actually, uh, founded and still based in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And you know, while Johnsonville exists as a consumer household staple in the United States, it really doesn't have that same homegrown loyalty in Canada. Um, so our primary mandate was to build new affinity and new loyalty and generate new trial among Canadian consumers through a very targeted effort, which drove site traffic and digital engagement, primarily around recipe inspirations, um, which we do a lot of in the food category. And, and that all of that engagement and traffic would ultimately, the goal was to lead to sort of product advocacy, new product advocacy for Johnsonville in Canada. And so um, this mandate continues to be a social advertising based initiative where the content is driving from those engaging platforms to Johnsonville's owned Canadian web property, which is johnsonville.ca. And you know, from our work with Johnsonville uh, in Canada, we know that over 50% of offline grocery sales are actually influenced by experiences that consumers are having with digital content. And that's really been driving a lot of our initiatives. So I'm gonna pause there and, and maybe with that, I'll start by passing off to Alice and George who will detail some maybe initial fundamentals for marketing success. I'll pass it over to you, Allison. Oh, thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I'm okay, great. So what's really important um, and, and the way that um, we always approach any marketing project on behalf of any brand is really ensuring that you as a marketer really can articulate and understand the fundamentals of your brand. And this is just gonna help you and it's gonna help any agency that works on your behalf. So Matthew, if you could just uh, put up the next slide. So one of the things we highly recommend that you as a small to medium sized food or beverage company in the US, you know, you really need to understand what are your business goals and objectives and, and objectives you wanna, you wanna really measure those. We wanna increase sales by 5% through international export, or we wanna extend distribution from one Walmart, uh, sorry, from one whole food store to 15 whole food stores in the next six months. So those are really clear business objectives. And so you, you wanna be prepared to say that out loud as you get ready to embark on a digital marketing program or any kind of marketing program. So what do you want to achieve and how will you measure it? So will it be measured by percentage sales? Will it be measured by um, inroads into a new international market or inroads into a new retail outlet? So you consider both of those things. And when, when and if you hire an agency to work with you, you want to be really clear with that agency. Listen, whatever program you, you know, we develop together, our main mandate is to um, 
change consumers' minds about our product and get them to buy it. And I want to see that measured by increase in sales. So those are the kinds of things you want to be prepared for. Matt, if you could um, flip to the next slide. Other things that you want to be able to speak about and describe to your agency. You want to be able to describe your company and what it stands for. And, and this may sound so simple. Yep, I make barbecue sauce. But it's really not that simple. You have to say, I make barbecue sauce that is um, in the, in the um, Louisiana style with just the right level of hot. You know, so you want to be able to articulate why you're making what you're making and why it's important. And again, this is going to motivate and inspire either your marketing or your agency who will help you do that. Um, why are you doing the project that you're doing? Um, I sometimes talk about flinging mud at the wall when it comes to marketing. It's, it's not great if you just try everything to sell your product. If you can be more selective um, in, 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 in what you're doing, more targeted, it's going to be beneficial. If you're talking about um, uh, a, a barbecue sauce that is um, excellent for marinating meat, uh, then you really don't want to be talking to a vegetarian audience, just as a very basic example. So you want to really clarify in your mind and then in anyone who's supporting you what, why are you doing this? And what are some of the challenges and opportunities? A challenge for you might be, you know, this is a premium priced product. I can give you lots of reasons why, um, but it is premium priced. So articulate that. Make sure that you, you understand your position in the market. Any insights into the category can be helpful as well. Um, you know, what is the competitive set like for your product? Is it something that is known and understood in the market that you're targeting? Um, is there something about it that would appeal to a particular um, retailer? For example, if your product has um, organic or all natural, then that may be more appealing to some of our, you know, organic garage is the name of a retailer here in Canada that might be intrigued by your product. So understanding that um, this is a higher end premium product with an organic certification, therefore the insight is we want to go after uh, a natural facing community. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Matthew. Um, and, and again, I just want to reinforce, if you are going to be talking to uh, an agency or a partner uh, like Matchstick, and you're trying to explain to them who you're aiming to reach, you know, Matchstick or other agencies, they can help you, but the more you know and understand your audience, the better. So if, if um, and it goes beyond, you know, uh, one of the uh, phrases I personally really uh, try to avoid is um, primary grocery shopper. That doesn't tell me a, a lot about the individual and you know right now we're seeing a dramatic shift here in Canada and probably the US as well in in the way that consumers are shopping so saying primary grocery shopper isn't going to be enough to inform your marketing campaign if you're going to be developing a, a social page campaign or something advertising campaign that's online um, the better you direct it at the individual who's making the decision, the better your results are going to be. So um, the funny story uh, I, can, I can relate is, um, you know, my mother is 84 years old and one of her friends recently tried e-commerce for the first time. And instead of getting, um, you know, one package of sausages, this poor woman got six packages of sausages. So if you're trying to talk to that person who's on e-commerce for the first time, your language has to be very descriptive around what they're actually going to receive when they make their purchase. So it's just understanding that audience. Um, you also want to know uh, what is the message about your product that you want to convey. 
uh, more than any other message. Is it that it is organic? Is it that it is authentic Louisiana style hot sauce? Um, is it that it is the best price in the market? Um, is it that it's an award-winning product? So understand what that message is around your product and being able to talk about it and try to make it unique. Um, what is it about your product that is different from the others in the market? Um, when you're developing those messages for your campaign, and again, you know, your agency, your partner in any market can offer you support. They'll tell you um, if they're good at their job, they will tell you when maybe you're heading in the wrong direction or maybe when your messaging is a bit murky, they're going to be able to support you uh, when you try to, to come up with the way that you position and market your product. You want to know when you develop a message, what is it that will help people know that what you're saying is true? So if you say that this is an award-winning product, well, how will they know it? Well, you're going to put a, you know, a, a gold seal on the label that says, you know, winner of. Um, what will help them feel it? If there is an emotional trigger, um, you know, uh, that could tie back to family, could tie back to heritage, could that tie back to love of a certain flavor, um, that's where you're going to evoke an emotional feeling. And I think I have one more slide here, Matthew. Um, the other consideration uh, when you're heading out to market and, and embark on a digital advertising campaign, um, you have to be able to say what you want and what you don't want. You know, for example, um, you know, you can be very selective about, you know, you, your budget is only going to go so far. So I need it to be limited within this budget range. So I can't go over this budget. You've got to understand what channels you want to be on, and this is where your your you know your partner or your own research can help you. And and by marketing channel, I mean um, is it going to be on Facebook? Is it going to be on Twitter? Is it going to be on on Instagram, Pinterest? These are social channels, but it also refers to a channel can be is it going to be advertising in um in a grocery store advertise uh, advertorial? Is it going to be uh, something done on television. Um, so think about that and work with your agency to try and determine the best way to reach your audiences. Uh, timing is really important. If you want your marketing campaign to hit exactly when you're going to be in market for a launch or a trade show or buyer meetings or simply because it, it's, you know, it's going to be um, our Canada Day long weekend and you want to go out with your messaging around a time when, when people are celebrating that, then you can uh, advise and plan around that deadline. And then finally, it's often helpful to look around and see what inspires you in terms of social media or ad campaigns. Matthew gave some good examples up at the top of things that I frankly I find inspiring. So if I was going to be thinking about, well, what do I want to do on social media? Um, I would probably be looking for examples of what I like. It's kind of like decorating a room and, and you know, pulling out color swatches and upholstery samples. You put that all together and suddenly you have a better picture of what this is going to look like in the end. Um, the last point before I, uh, Matthew gets into some of the brass tacks is the 50% cost share. The cost share program offered by SUSTA really opens the opportunity for you to quite cost effectively embark on some campaigns. Um, I would recommend uh, definitely working closely with uh, the cost share partners at SUSTA just to ensure that everything you plan is um, refundable um, because so much of it is and you just want to be able to make sure that what you're doing takes as full advantage of the program uh, than it can. And by then I will pass this on to Matthew to continue with uh, the social media marketing. Okay, thank you, Allison. So, you know, we thought we'd do a quick dip into the world of social media in, in Canada specifically, and then uh, talk about some broader best practices. Um, you know, as a social media marketer, um, I tend to focus a lot on Facebook and Instagram, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, you know, really for marketers, not all social media platforms are equal. 
we're always hearing about the latest and greatest or newest platform. Um, but the reality is when we look at the numbers and, and you know, Canada is not that dissimilar to the United States in this regard or, or globally, you know, Facebook is so far out in front in terms of their user base, um, their infrastructure, the tools that they offer for marketers. And certainly that extends, of course, to Instagram. Many of you know the connection between those companies and how ads run between those two platforms. Um, so um, for us, they make a very different uh, you know, opportunity uh, and we tend to focus there. And I think um, in my years of working in digital and social media marketing, the things we've learned by using these platforms, Facebook, Instagram, have been very applicable um, as the ad platforms develop on other channels. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, you know, something very important in Canada, um, you know, mobile access of social media is very high. It's over 90%. So that means that more than 90% of Canadians are primarily accessing social media via mobile. And everything we do as an agency is, is mobile-centric for that reason. And then more recently, uh, of course, there has been an interesting trend during uh, this coronavirus social distancing period. We've seen uh, more than a 40% increase in social media usage. And actually that really presents an opportunity for companies and brands and, and possibly, of course, looking ahead, um, not only are there more Canadians on social media uh, today uh, actively using social media, but that has had an impact on the cost of social media spending, uh, ad spending, meaning the cost has come down uh, and you can do more with with less money these days. And that's that's been quite exciting. You know, so in Canada, I mentioned, you know, Facebook has the largest share of social media users. Um, really for many Canadians, I've said this many times, Facebook remains as their dominant internet mobile experience. It's sort of where they're spending the most time and, and where the most internet hours are going. Um, and that's not to say that we don't look at other platforms, we very much do, but um, I really believe in getting the Facebook Instagram formula right uh, because it is so big, because it is so dominant. Um, Instagram, of course, being about half the size of Facebook in Canada in terms of its penetration within the online population. And there's, of course, a host of other platforms, new ones like TikTok or emerging ones like Snapchat that we're looking very closely at with a lot of our clients. And Pinterest, for instance, has grown tremendously in Canada and might be of specific interest, for instance, for recipe content, food content, beverage content. We do quite a bit of work with them in Canada, but compared to the impact and reach of Facebook, these platforms are not quite uh, you know, in the same playing field as we say. So um, when I do a talk like this, I like to almost come all the way back to basics. And I wanna start with this conversation about organic uh, content versus paid advertising. And, you know, probably for most of you, if not all of you, this, this, uh, this screen is unfamiliar. Um, this algorithm, as, as I've called it here, the Facebook newsfeed algorithm. Um, this, of course, the, the newsfeed algorithm is what determines what each user will see in their individual newsfeed. And actually, there's some recent data that suggests that when any one of us as users come to our mobile news feed, there's as much as 300 feet, scrolling feet of content to move through. Facebook likes to say it's about as tall as the Statue of Liberty. Uh, and that's unique to each individual in each moment they, they return to that news feed. And the big difference here between organic content, which is content that all of us post for free, including companies on their brand pages, um, you post daily, weekly, monthly, etc. The big difference between that content and content that has paid media dollars behind it is how the algorithm treats it, of course. When you publish organically, uh, continually, you are unfortunately or fortunately in some cases at the whim of how this algorithm operates. And the challenge that we've brought to our clients is um, we call this challenge uh, you know, building a property on rented land. Uh, the land that Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok offers to us, of course, is not controllable fully or ownable fully 
by our companies. And this has caused recently, in recent years, a lot of upheaval toward the, the view of, of these channels and what the opportunity means for brands and products. Um, and, and let me tell you what it means. It means that the value of organic content, the impact of organic content, as companies like Facebook tweak their algorithms, um, that value of that content diminishes. It becomes much harder, of course, to reach your fans or followers and much less impactful. I'm sure there isn't anyone on this call today that hasn't experienced uh, this impact. And that is why when I do talks like this, I almost never talk about uh, organic content strategies um, because there's, there's a much more meaningful uh, path to take. And for us, that's the path of a paid media strategy. And I want to I wanna really dive into this. We feel at our agency that leading with paid media is really essential for success. The opportunities, uh, the tools, the data sets allow for performance that would you know, really eclipse quickly anything that an organic strategy could achieve. And that is not true in every single case, but it is true in enough cases that we make a practice of promoting the paid media strategies that social media offers and the targeting strategies, you know, within the data sets and platforms to create a more ownable marketing plan. And here's something, if there's one thing I want to leave you with today, um, and I'm not finishing yet, but this is sort of a, a bigger thought. When we move from being an organic publisher on social media to a paid publisher, uh, a user of paid techniques, we move from being a social media user to being a social media marketer. And that delineation is one that we've really brought to our clients. We have to think of social media no longer as a user. Even if you're running your own company or your own page, you have to think like a social media marketer. And that lens is a very, very different one. And I want to keep going here and drilling into what, what we mean by that. You know, the first thing I want to talk about is, is paid media allocation. I get asked a lot about what the right amount of money would be to spend or to allocate, frankly, to a marketing campaign or a paid media uh, effort on a platform like Instagram or Facebook. We tend to go by a 50-50 rule allocation, meaning your target should be that um, you'd have 50% of your budget on non-working sort of content development and 50%, the other 50% would be on a working investment. So for each dollar spent making content, we ask that you spend a dollar promoting that content. And you know, the truth is a little can go a long way here. And I've used a bit of an extreme example. I mentioned that in this current climate, the CPMs or cost per thousand impressions has really declined, um, which is great for marketing campaigns. So today, $100, um, you know, can easily drive in the neighborhood of 10,000 impressions with, you know, your target consumer. Uh, and that, that's important to understand. It would be very hard to duplicate that effort, you know, uh, ongoing with just an organic strategy. And by the way, non-working includes, you know, photography, video, writing, editing, all of the investment that you make to produce content. Our rule of thumb is to try to match that with uh, a working investment. And by the way, there's a reason why I don't, I don't call this a one-to-one -one allocation. And that's because I'm not suggesting that you take everything that you've spent in content and then try to add on to it, you know, an additional 50%. There's another way to look at this. It's maybe we should half the effort that we're putting into content and, and are non-working and use that savings toward a paid media investment, for instance. And we can get more into that. You know, sticking with kind of the ABCs of marketing on, on these platforms, um, I am not talking about, when I talk about paid media, I'm not talking about boosting content uh, through your, your Facebook page. I'm talking about using the tools, the, the, the back-end tools that Facebook offers for free. And, and in this case, the ads manager product that Facebook has developed is, it's absolutely excellent. It does take some time uh, to learn and get used to, but once you're in there, almost every 
other social media platform has modeled their ad approach on Facebook ads manager. So investing in learning a tool like this, um, <clears throat> frankly, it really can pay off in the long term. And Facebook knows this. They offer this tool for free, by the way, to all advertisers, anyone who has a, a company page. And they even have certifications uh, that are free to all of you to access. So there's a, a course that Facebook offers online called Blueprint. I highly recommend that you or someone from your team or your agency uh, you know, look into this if they haven't already. Many companies are aware of this, but Blueprint is a great path for developing an understanding of the underpinnings of a tool like Facebook or Instagram. And as I said, moving from becoming a, a social media user to a social media marketer, a, a very important step in my opinion. <clears throat> I wanna spend a bit of time drilling into what we call the sort of ABCs of, of social media advertising. And I think, you know, for us um, in consulting with new companies or even companies who are sort of at a median stage in terms of their social media investment. These are the six things that we really focus on. And I want to just kind of quickly go through them um, on this webinar. And I don't have time to kind of dive into the real depths of each of them, but, but let's explore this for a second. So the first one, and I really like what um, Allison was getting at in terms of understanding you know, not only your brand, but what, what you're looking to achieve. And, and the ad objective couldn't be more important. There's a reason why we put it first. Many of you may not even realize that there are many different objectives and, and outcomes to advertising on social media. And each campaign uh, should have a desired objective, a desired outcome that's preset. And of course, that's, that's how you're going to measure that campaign is knowing what that ad set or that individual ad or that campaign is, is hoping to achieve. Um, Allison talked about knowing your audience. I mean, that's extremely important on social media. If you don't know who you're targeting, if you don't know those nuances, it's very difficult to mine, you know, this vast landscape of consumer data. Uh, and I'll come back to this, this point in a minute because it is very important is defining uh, an audience on social media which platform, uh, which type of placement, and placement refers to things like, you know, mobile or desktop or video or, or story feed versus news feed. Um, understanding and trying and testing those things is very important. Your content, of course, is extremely important and optimizing that content uh, for mobile news feed. And I will talk about this again in a minute. Um, budgeting I've touched on, you know, making sure that you've set parameters around how much you can spend either for this period being a week or two weeks or this quarter or this year and, and testing to see what's what's delivering results for you. Uh, and, and, you know, if I may say so, that's one of the promises of digital marketing is that quickly um, we should be able to understand what's working and what's not working. And that's that's F, which is optimization. Um, the, the beauty of advertising on platforms like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, is that we can optimize hourly, daily. If something's not working, we'll know it's not working very quickly. And that optimization leads to a really, um, you know, efficient use of budget and effective, uh, you know, drive toward ROI. From an advanced step, step, I mean, if we were to take sort of one step further, um, a message we often bring to our clients is to build toward conversion. And this also comes back to this idea of, you know, the fact that if, if you're just posting content on a Facebook page, you are developing, you know, your brand world on, on rented land, I like to say. Um, how do we begin to own that and, and as a company or as a brand? Uh, build toward owning conversion and driving conversion that's a little bit more meaningful, uh, of course, than likes or shares or comments. And this is through conversion strategies. So using things like social media pixels. So Facebook, as some of you may know, offers what's called a pixel, which is a line of code, for instance, that can be installed on any website, your website, uh, your brand's website, to track movement from social media to your website and to drive outcomes and events. 
It could be watching content. It could be leaving your email. It could be making a purchase on an e-commerce site, driving to those conversions and tracking them through amazingly the free tools, you know, that Facebook offers to marketers can be really effective. And from there, um, once you have an understanding of what's working, that's when audience segmentation really gets interesting because you can start to segment out those consumers who have visited your website, who have visited your product, who've watched video A or video B, and you can then of course retarget those individuals and build more of an ecosystem that, you know, frankly, you're in control of uh, and can develop month over month or year over year. How do you do that? How do you get there? It's through testing and learning and optimizing. There are no shortcuts here. Everything you do is a learning opportunity. Every ad you run is a test. And once you get you know, the cycles in of that, that process, you optimize from there and, and build a strategy that, that really works for you. I'm getting a little bit more granular here and maybe a little bit technical. Um, on this topic of testing, it's something that, you know, we as an agency really take to heart. Every ad flight, every campaign is an opportunity to test something. And luckily, uh, through Facebook Ads Manager, they have a built-in process of being able to test content. It's called split testing, or some of you may know it as A-B testing. It allows you to simultaneously test different versions of an ad, meaning you can swap out content or copy or target different groups. And, you know, it's, it's important to look at the different variables here. Do you want to try a slightly different piece of creative? Do you want to know if video content works better for you than still photography content? Do you want to test a younger audience versus an older audience, males and females? Um, where you deliver that content and how it's placed. Lots of different options for uh, always, uh, always on testing, as we like to say, and learning what's working for you. And because it works for one company does not mean it's going to work for another. There, this is not one size fits all. We always encourage our clients uh, to, to dive in and test and, and learn from that experience. It's very really important. You know, lastly, I'll just touch on audience in, in this section. And some of you may know that there are options for developing audiences uh, through Ads Manager. And the, the most common way to define an audience uh, for your ad or for your brand is through what we call interest targeting. And that's built on the vast data set, you know, that Facebook and Instagram and Pinterest and Twitter have collected a day in and day out. It's based on, you know, where people are, their demographics, um, their lifestyle interests, content they've clicked on, content they've seen, their job titles, associations they may be, a, or groups they may be a part of, and of course, competitor brands, um, because when you're doing targeting on these platforms, it, uh, you know, uh, Allison mentioned, you know, no, knowing who you're competing against, you can actually name those competitors and even target fans or individuals who have interacted with your competitor's content, a really neat option. From there, it gets more deeper. Um, the, the ability to build custom audiences exists on both Facebook and Instagram. And that's where you're bringing your own data set uh, to the platform. So um, your own customer list or your own newsletter list or lists from client and trade associations. Uh, these are now portable into the Facebook platform for, for targeting or retargeting. And once you have, uh, you know, executed custom audiences, you're eligible to build what are called lookalike audiences, where a small audience of, of a customer base, let's say, could be modeled using the Facebook, uh, you know, platform data to build a much broader, what we call lookalike audience that can be 10 or 12 or 20 times the size of your own customer audience. So people who are like your customers or who look like your customers based on social platform data. 
uh, I'm just conscious of time here. So I'm going to skip into uh, a section on content. Um, we, we talk a lot about the ads and, and I think what's really important is an understanding of sort of where's social mobile content at today. And, and the truth is we, <clears throat> all of us as marketers are now really living in what we call the age of social video. Um, video has been for now many months, if not years, a dominant uh, form of content on these platforms. You know, with especially with 5G around the corner, we're going to see more and more streaming video content as brand content on platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat, of course. Um, I often say, you know, video is not the best word for this. I think um, really a good description is motion. When we think about creating content for mobile phones, we think about creating motion uh, and that can be done through graphics. It can be done through actual video. The size of it is very important. Um, we don't want, we don't want to shoot horizontal video anymore. We want to shoot square or vertical video and the length is not really a one size fits all uh, plan. I think a lot of people get hung up on the length of their content. Um, but the real truth is that it's the it's the early seconds that count when we think about successful social mobile content. It, it, a lot happens in the first three seconds. That's where the hook happens. That's where your brand needs to be. It needs to be right up front. Um, the real trajectory of social media views is that you get most of them, of course, within the first few seconds and then they start to drop off from there. So if your brand message and brand hook is 15 seconds later or 60 seconds later, um, you know, that's gonna be more challenging to drive success uh, on social media from. Of course, all of this content should not be dependent on audio. Um, we sometimes look to graphics and motion to sort of tell that story. Um, as much in Canada, the latest stat I saw was that 80% of users are scrolling through their newsfeed with audio turned off. So if your content is dependent on an audio message, um, it's not going to be heard and that content will inevitably fail compared to content that can live, you know, with, with graphics or motion. And then I, I, I couldn't not mention um, Instagram story ads. You know, both Facebook and Instagram have made a significant commitment to this new type of news feed, which is the stories news feed. And you know, these are, these are of course time sensitive, full screen pieces of content. And increasingly they are attractive. Uh, it's an attractive environment for advertisers. These are, full screen mobile ads that live in between organic stories. They're not published to your brand's newsfeed. They have a, uh, you know, a time life that lives only in the stories newsfeed. And they offer a real sort of immersive experience, uh, again, where graphics, mobile and video movement um, can tell a story in a very short period of time. Um, they are very skippable. And we, you know, we certainly something that we watch, you only need to touch an ad, of course, to make it disappear. But that also makes it in some ways consumer friendly uh, and the environment. I mean, think of how quickly you can skip past an ad. To balance that off, we've seen really good conversion or cost per click from Instagram story ads in our recent travels. And we're really big proponents of this environment, you know, certainly for CPG, food and drink and beverage uh, advertisers. It, it's, it, there's the options here for creating engaging moments with consumers are really developing in an, in an interesting way. I know we're running short on time. Should I, I have a, one more slide, Danielle. Um, how would that be? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I think that the presentation is really interesting and we don't have many questions. So I would say let's keep going. Okay, uh, fantastic. You know, a, a, a last thought um, is, is how we might work with influencers in 2020. And uh, at Matchstick and Argyle, we have an extensive history and practice of engaging influential consumers, uh, you know, on behalf of our, of our brand clients. And I wanted to paint a particular picture here about how we approach it. 
Uh, and it's a little different, I think, than, than how traditionally influencers are seen. Um, we're big proponents of this. And I think working with influencers can be a very effective and really important part of a, of a you know, successful campaign and, and a, a good, healthy marketing uh, effort. Um, the way we do that is through what we call influencer co-creation. And what we're looking for here is content, primarily content from influencers. The fact that they might publish or uh, reach their fans and their you know, uh, followers is in our mind a bonus in this plan. What we're really doing here is tasking influencers, micro influencers, macro influencers, ho however you wanna describe them. We're tasking them to create content for us. So to take our product, our brand or our service and integrate it into their own lifestyle content. And then um, we take that content from them uh, through, through the arrangement with them and we use it as advertising on our own brand channel. And actually more recently, uh, both Instagram and Facebook have rolled out a very neat opportunity, a tool that allows a brand channel to advertise in influencer content. They're called branded content ads. And uh, some of you may be familiar with these. It's where you see this line that says paid in partnership. I know it's very small on the screen here, um, just down at the bottom here. So this is an example of an ad with an influencer where the, the ad is actually being paid for, in this case, by Lululemon, even though the content comes into, in this case, a consumer's newsfeed with the influencer's Instagram handle top, uh, front and center. So what we're doing there is leveraging ultimately the relevance and credibility of this influencer on behalf of a brand. Uh, and that, that sort of um, bypasses the need to worry about whether the influencer is doing their job in reaching their fans. We can take that content and be more in control of its distribution and ultimately uh, its success. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity. And then Danielle, we'd love to take uh, any questions if there are some. Yes, for sure. Um, we do have a few questions coming in. That was so interesting. And um, I mean, I know I'm taking notes and my team was texting me saying, oh, we're taking notes too. So thank you. Um, all right, we right, let's get started with Q&A. Is it premature to do this if we don't have distribution in Canada yet? I can jump on that one. Um, uh, you know, every company on this call will be at a different stage of development and preparedness to enter the Canadian market. So that is really dependent on your individual company. Um, if you are seeking a relationship with a buyer or retailer and you're really close to securing that deal, and one thing that might put it over the edge uh, to your favor is to show that buyer um, that, hey, we are getting interest and people are, are paying attention to us and we are willing to invest in Canada from a marketing perspective, then this can be quite a cost-effective way, um, particularly if you're leveraging uh, content that you already have developed in the United States. Um, the other, uh, so that's just a very important consideration for some companies. For others who aren't as far along the continuum, it may be best to wait before specifically targeting Canadian channels with the caveat that if you are willing and able to sell to Canada and that product is available on your website, then most certainly you can target Canadians and we can go uh, be redirected to your site to purchase. Yep, interesting. And I would like to do a little plug for Susta here um, to piggyback on that answer. Um, social media ads and campaigns like this, um, if you are targeting a foreign audience, um, and, that, and that can be demonstrated in the invoice and, you know, in your campaign that you're targeting, um, you know, an audience in another country, you can request 50% reimbursement of the expense of that ad. So developing the content translation and, you know, the actual cost of um, uh, publishing that ad. Um, all right, next question. For audience definition, what tools are out there to help us determine audiences in an international market? 
Uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll chime in from the sort of social media opportunity. I mean, there are lots of digital tools that sort of navigate, uh, you know, the lifestyles of Canadians and, and segment them. Um, we do look a lot into the social data from, that Facebook has. And as I mentioned, you know, they, they offer this. It's free to advertisers. Um, it's, it's their audience profiling. So um, you can go in and identify some, some initial interests um, that you believe your target audience might have. And Facebook will actually start adding to that uh, list of interests. And even what's neat about that is you can start to see the makeup of those audiences. Where are they? How big are they? And, and what they're doing there, of course, is uh, showcasing the, the advertising opportunity uh, regionally or nationally for that given uh, given group. Um, but that, that also assumes that you have some initial thoughts on who you might want to target and how you might approach that. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. What should we look for in an influencer? Do you want to take that, Alison? I, I have some thoughts. <laughs> yeah, we can probably both, uh, both take it. You know, um, you're looking for authenticity, you're looking for transparency, you're looking with, uh, for somebody whose uh, uh, community um, matches the community you're trying to reach, but you have to be careful here. Uh, some influencers will charge a lot of money for very little in return, something that you can't necessarily maximize. And because these are identified um, as you know, paid for by a by a supplier, they may. Um, we just have to be careful with the authenticity here. Um, so I, you know, the example I when we were talking about this yesterday is Kim Kardashian. You're going to spend a lot of money for an alignment with a, a a a personality like that, whereas you might have far more meaningful uh, interactions and engagement with somebody who is an authentic person, uh, developing recipes in their kitchen that they talk to about to their communities and then you can take that recipe and push it out to your uh, audiences that you've selected through paid social advertising. And Matthew, please jump in on that. Uh, thanks, Allison. You know, my, my one build there is we look at influencers as, you know, certainly a relationship that you might want to think of over a longer period of time. We do caution, you know, these influencer transactions, which, you know, tend to be very short sighted and short term. Um, and that, that doesn't often benefit a brand. Influencers can move obviously quickly from one product to the other. I think once, once you've found someone that you might have interest in, it's, it's worth developing that relationship. And I think it pays off over time because of course, influencers have ongoing opportunities, you know, to message about who you are and what you represent, the better they know you, the more they know you, um, you know, the better the fit. So, so think of the long term. I think is really important. And then if, if there's an initial sort of screener, you know, I love that idea of authenticity. And, and does, does the, the content that that influencer creates work or correlate with your vision for your product? I think that's really important because um, we shouldn't ask influencers to be people they're not or to do things that they just don't do. They are who they are. And, and I think watching them, studying them, looking at their content is, is the best indicator for what you're gonna get looking ahead. That makes sense. All right, are there additional ways to measure social ad campaigns beyond impressions and engagement? There very much is, it's a great question. I think um, so many social media marketers are stuck at that point of, you know, what we call social media metrics or, or, or dare I even say vanity metrics, like how many fans or followers are we acquiring? You'll notice I haven't touched on that once today uh, it's not even something we typically talk about. Uh, it's that meaningless, ultimately, in the grand scheme. You know, how many fans or followers you have on Instagram, that's not a number we, we want to count. The, the move beyond impressions and, and, and uh, engagements is, is, as I said before, it's conversion. And conversion can be actions that your consumers or your target consumers are taking that are meaningful to you. So are they, are they A, 
coming to your website? Are they spending time there? That's a conversion action moving from watching a video on social to now spending time on your website and, and looking through your products. So time spent, for instance, and visits to a website are conversion metrics. Um, offering you their information. Do you have a newsletter? Have they registered for that? Um, that's another type of conversion. And of course, the ultimate type of conversion would be converting to a sale, purchasing through retail or e-com, or uh, advocating uh, for your brand in some fashion that's, that's trackable. So lots of different steps beyond that sort of initial phase of just an impression. All trackable. Yep, okay, that's good to know. Um, you hear so much about impressions. Um, what are the preferred products that sell well through social media in Canada? Yeah, so um, it's interesting that uh, this question has come up on this at this time. Uh, this is changing dramatically because of COVID-19. Um, I've heard uh, statistics that are all over the map on this, but Canadians lagged behind on e-commerce for food and grocery items. Uh, we were about 3% um, of uh, e-commerce transactions. And I've heard, Matthew, maybe you've heard, I've heard 12% now. Um, so we're very quickly escalating and catching up to other markets. So what we're expecting, and we've done some research into what's going on in the grocery sector, um, we're expecting a lot more movement towards um, online ordering, online pickup. Uh, products that you can purchase online, which does point to um, either uh, shelf staple items that are packaged um, cost effectively and non and um, not uh, breakable. Uh, we're also uh, expecting uh, companies that do have items that are a little bit more um, uh, difficult to 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 ship, like um, produce items or things that are fragile. Um, to maybe even consider changing their packaging model in order to accommodate this uh, shipping. So it's, it's something we are watching and it is changing and we don't know, we do believe it's going to continue to be that way um, forever. Yep. One of the trends that's going to, that's going to stick. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, back to influencers. Um, I I believe that's what uh, the question is. Um, in terms of finding an influencer, should you be looking at their number of followers and their number of posts? You know, I think um, it, it really depends on what your strategy is. If you're, if you're hoping that that influencer is going to make content for your brand and post it, of course, yes, their, their organic reach certainly matters. Mm -hmm. The model I presented a minute ago um, wouldn't be dependent on that. Uh, it wouldn't matter if they had a large following or a smaller following. And, and I, I tend to say, don't discount influencers. I call them micro influencers who have a smaller audience. Uh, it, it can certainly be a meaningful one. And, and I'll, I won't even mention a number. I think small is, is, uh, is relative. It depends on what you think is small or large in your, in your space or category. But using that influencer's content as, as your own advertisement uh, is that strategy is independent of whether they have a large or small following and anything they can do on their own is, is as I said, a bonus. Okay. Great. Um, somebody else asked, how do you contact an influencer? Do you message them or is there a, a more professional way to find them? Uh, well, there's, uh, you know, they like to be contacted and they're used to be contacted through the channel itself. I mean, what's nice about that is they can visit you and see who you are. Uh, and, and that's important. Of course, you want to be ready to reach out to an influencer because they are going to look at who you are and what you do as a company um, before they probably respond. And, and many larger influencers get a lot of requests this way. Some make email addresses available either through their social media mm -hmm. accounts or on their blogs. Uh, and that's another way, of course, to reach out. But we have found uh, that the initial content usually starts uh, from one social media channel to another. Got it. That makes sense. I, 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 wanna, I wanna build on that question and the answer. So it's great to contact an influencer, 
uh, but as you begin to have a conversation about what your expectations are, what you want them to do, what you want to do with the content they create, um, you, you are entering a, a contractual arrangement there. Um, this is not, you know, hey, great, awesome handshake stuff. This is clearly delineated. This is what you're going to do for us. And this is what we're going to do together so that it, and this is how much we're going to pay you. And this is what we expect from you. Um, sometimes they, um, they have access to metrics about the performance of, of what they've done for you that they have to share with us. So we, we just really, um, you know, as an agency that, that deals with influencers frequently, we really contract with those guys, formal written signed contracts. Right. Yep. It is a business. Um, yeah, it's a business. I'm just being mindful of time. We have a few more questions. Allison and Matthew, are you okay to stay on? For a few moments? Yes. Okay. And for everybody else, if you have to get off, we are recording this. Um, I know I've seen that come in the Q&A a few times. So yes, it's being recorded. We'll post it. Um, it'll be behind the MySest to log in. Um, tomorrow, you'll get an email. So fear not if you have to leave. Um, all right. Could you please share an estimated cost for developing content and launching a marketing campaign um, for a new brand in Canada? And then once it's launched, what would be an estimated monthly cost? For a small brand, ballpark. Um, I mean, I can, I can speak from a digital perspective. I think um, we, sometimes we, it comes down to, and often we do start with the paid media investment. From, from a digital standpoint, it is almost like the oxygen of a campaign. And then secondarily, what, what can we do creatively? And, you know, th there's, no, there's no rule of thumb here. I think, you know, if you can afford... Uh, a, a couple thousand dollars a month, you know, two, three, up to five thousand dollars a month, uh, you know, in, in paid media spending, you know, that that's great. I think in a, in a market like Canada, we can do a lot with that. And then on top of that uh, would be your costs for producing content and, and developing assets. And, and it, can, it can be lower than that, of course, especially if you're going it on your own. Um, but if you're only able to spend hundred to five hundred dollars for instance you know uh, weekly or monthly that would be very hard to break through not impossible and i think it can make a good start but you're probably looking at in the minimum let's say two to four thousand a month and we have clients who spend you know ten to twenty thousand dollars monthly on paid media for social okay um Somebody else is asking how uh, they would like to see a preferred list of companies, agencies um, that are knowledgeable on social media. Um, I mean, obviously Matchstick does that, but that wasn't really <laughs> the webinar. Um, uh, I don't, I guess if somebody wanted to do research on agencies, not just in Canada, but anywhere, uh, what would, is there any um, recommendation? Yeah, of course. I mean, there, there are, um, you know, there's industry uh, sources for, for PR agencies, uh, you know, the Canadian PR Association, there's the CMA, the Canadian Marketing Association, um, you know, two, two sources that leap to mind. There are also some good um, industry voices in, in, in Canada, for instance, um, that track what's happening in the agency world. One of them is Strategy Online. Uh, is, a, is, a, is a tool or a publisher that, that follows the industry and media in Canada would be another that leaps to mind. Uh, and, you know, sometimes even the big ones like Ad Age or Ad Week, you know, follow what's happening in the Canadian market and name agencies. And uh, if, if you've seen a campaign and you want to know who's behind it, um, those, those resources can often identify those agencies and partners. Okay. Great. Uh... Should SESTA exporters target Canadian importers B2B or consumers B2C in terms of social media marketing? Yeah, I'll, I, I can jump on that one. So um, right now uh, we're recommending social media market for a business to consumer um, as a business consumer strategy. Um, the business to business strategy will certainly involve uh, digital media, social media tools. So the way we reach them. Um, and some of the business to consumer 
paid media is likely to reach your targets on a business to business basis, if that makes sense. I'm thinking in my mind of the person who's making the buying decisions for a retailer. Is that person on social media and could they be targeted by your efforts? Yeah, probably. Um, are enough of them there and identifiable that an investment in this kind of paid digital strategy to reach them and only them, is that really the best channel? Probably not. That may be better reached through an alignment with a publication um, newsletter that reaches the community that you're trying to target on a B2B basis. It might be reached through a SESTA program where there's a mission put in place where business to business meetings are being organized for you. Um, that's, that's just one way to look at it. And I hope that helps illuminate it. Uh, Matthew, do you have anything to add on to that? No, I think that's, that's great. That's great. I agree. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, I think that is everything. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. Um, I, well, there were a few from, uh, a company that I know who I will answer independently. Um, so Brian, hang tight. Um, but for everybody else, thank you so much for being with us today. This was um, such an interesting presentation uh, for all of us. It will be, again, it will be, um, it's recorded. It will be on our website tomorrow, as well as the PDF of the presentation. So if uh, you want to rewatch it or share it with some coworkers, um, feel free. And Allison and Matthew, thank you so much for your time today. That was uh, great information. A pleasure. Thank you. Thank All you, right. Oh, and before I forget, uh, we have another webinar, of course, next week. We are targeting the India market. Uh, we'll be hearing from Devna Khanna with I2I Consulting on how um, the opportunities in India and how to access that market. So please register, and uh, we hope to see you next week. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.